On this uh, uh, episode of I99, I have with me Constantino Xavier, and we're going to talk about uh, India's relationship, uh, in India's relations with the Portuguese-speaking world. You know, I've always felt that uh, India's foreign policy involves engaging three types of countries: uh, countries that make trouble for us, countries that play cricket with us, and the countries that host a large number of our Malayali population. And Portugal doesn't fit. Now, Portugal and the Portuguese-speaking world doesn't fit any of these three, so that's why we have not so great relations with, not so exciting relations with the Portuguese-speaking world. So, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're well. There's a huge Indian diaspora actually. Many of these Portuguese-speaking countries. There's um, a lot of people in Mozambique, a lot of people in Angola, especially the new diaspora going there. Hmm. But yeah, what I think got us started pretty much thinking about this was my work in on Africa, in his Africa policy, and there's a. Uh, um, four Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa. Some people you just don't know that, and this is a huge market. Especially Angola and Mozambique are countries which have huge mineral resources. The economies who are important for Indian goods. You have Mozambique, which is extremely important in the Indian Ocean for the Indian naval, for the navy. And um, it was just surprising there was this lack of apps and lack of, of interest, lack of knowledge about the specificity of these countries. That they speak Portuguese. They're not francophone. They're not anglophone. And um, I started looking at that in certain ways of potential for India's foreign policy to find a niche. And um, I think, I think and the worst thing is that you have a lot of investment going on to these countries, right, in Indian foreign policy. So there's a recognition that Africa is important, that you invest in here, mm -hmm. you need stimulate relations, but somehow just a lack of strategy. So that example we talked about before, yeah. I was in Delhi in 2006, and I just get this phone call from a a student from Guinea-Bissau, which is a Portuguese-speaking country, is a journalist with the television of Guinea-Bissau, and he was in Delhi for um, an ITEC scholarship by the Ministry of External Affairs. That's the International Technology and Economic Technic Co Economic Cooperation, Cooperation yeah. which is basically foreign assistance. And it's a great program. It's a program India has since the 60s, hmm. right, and runs it and gives to developing countries students who come every year for technical education in India. This guy was from Guinea-Bissau, and his bad luck was he didn't speak a word of English. And he, he landed uh, next to JNU, where I was studying at that time, right. the Institute of Mass Communication Studies, right. Right. to study broadcast journalism. And he spent three months in Delhi, right, without speaking a word of English, right. um, um, hanging around. Now, while well, Pavan Varma earlier, the Lit Fest here in Goa, was mentioning this is a glitch and this doesn't happen. No, it's not true. This happens regularly because right. it's just a lack of knowledge that these countries speak different languages. And why not send these people, right? We can go and we're discussing this. Why not send them down to Goa uh, and have um, um, them study journalism here? They'll be happier and they'll leave with a great image of India. It's this diverse country in which you can go to a place which is so close to Guinea-Bissau, to Mozambique, to Angola, and, and go back. So these st this is just a little story to show, I think, that there's a lot of potential in terms of diversifying an foreign policy. Um, and using little regions, in this case, Goa. Right. But uh, tell me about Goa itself, right? How Do you think uh, Goa uh, can be a sort of focus, fulcrum of, uh, of this exercise? Or as Pawan Verma was saying today, uh, you know, you could have relationships with uh, Brazil and Portugal and the others independently, or the African countries independently of Goa. So you, Goa is not central to this whole thing. Well, let's look what the Chinese are doing, right? And not being China-centric, but the Chinese have started the Macau Forum, which is uh, into several editions already. It's an annual forum, a biannual forum, of ministers of economic, um, of, of, of the economy, of, uh, between the Chinese and the eight Portuguese-speaking countries in the world. It includes Timor-Leste, very rich in mineral resources. You've written about that in your brief and you've been there. Uh, that includes Brazil, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Portugal and Europe. So these are several countries which are very important. The Chinese recognize here a specific asset, right? Let's bring them down to Macau, which was a Portuguese colony until 99, where they feel at home, where they feel comfortable. And let's try to, you know, get them closer to China and they have managed to do that. So why not Goa? Why not a forum Goa? Or even a forum Mumbai, which was Portuguese till the mid-17th century, by the way, right? That's right. And uh, these gr a great financial capital of India. And, and have these um, economic, strategic cooperation dialogue with these countries. Yeah, and when you think that uh, BRIC, which is a sort of a uh, acronym created by an investment bank analyst, uh, he just took con big countries which have 8% growth and more, and put them together and call it BRIC, and say, hey, you have a BRIC forum. And you know, our people believe that BRICS, uh, because this is this alphabet soup of big countries, is suddenly a cohesive international forum, right? To have. Yeah. So, so when you can believe in a thing like BRICS, I'm sure you should, you know, the the, the Goa factor uh, is something which you should be putting in front because we have it. I mean, it was yeah. another story if we didn't, right? If it's if you're some strange 
a country which wants to build relations with, with the Portuguese speaking world and they didn't have a, any uh, Portuguese links uh, or you know Portuguese heritage then yes you you've got to invent, invent ways but when you have something in front yeah, well in this case it's 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 clear you would even actually solve two problems right in Goa there's a certain not discontent, but a certain issue, right? Pavan Verma called it again, to quote him again here, in self-obsession, right? right? And that's just because, in many ways, this was a very distinct territory of India, which was colonized by the Portuguese, for good and for bad, and has these wonderful links, right? Mozambique was governed for more than 100 years from Goa, right? This was ruled from here. Macau, East Timor, these were territories which, even today, you know, go to East Timor, the Catholic priests who fought Indonesian occupation right. were Goans, right? right? And they don't want to hear about Indian Goa, but they they are Goans. There's a, there's that contact. And other right. Indians, Gujarati merchants, right. etc., that diaspora too. But the point is that this is something which would also, I think, be very of great interest to people in Goa, right? And we have people discussing that, and several former ministers have been discussing this possibility. I think that's something which should be discussed. yeah, and and even in the wider economy, right? I mean, uh, I think someone today mentioned that there is nothing which. Uh, uh, Europe can teach uh, uh, can teach uh, the rest of the world and countries like India. I, I I don't think that's true because if you look at high touch industries mm -hmm. like design, uh, you know which kind of uh, industries which have a huge premium over uh, in the manufacturing sector, countries of southern Europe, you know, Portugal, Spain, Italy, they they are just leaders in this field, mm -hmm. and and there are things which we can learn in terms of economic partnerships with these countries, but. You know, there is this broad brush which is made out to say that these countries can't teach us anything. And I think the, the, there is a, a sense within these countries that, mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've screwed up big time with colonialism. So we have no right to talk to uh, yeah. to anybody else. But but the, the fact is that there are things we, we, we can learn. And uh, whether it's technology transfer, whether it's through business. Uh, but I guess uh, uh, until, until uh, a, a sort of narrative emerges that uh, we can interact with countries like Portugal uh, in ways like we interact mm. with countries like Brazil, we'll still have this... Uh, well, there's a white man's burden for sure, right? Portugal's not interested in coming to tell Delhi, hey, do this forum here and there, right? But what I think is that countries like Brazil are very interested. I was in Sao Paulo in May and you have this new diaspora, an amazing Indian diaspora of people mm. are very interested in exploring it relations in with Brazil. With so Brazil, there's a diaspora in Brazil. Yeah, the new, new okay. people. There's an older diaspora too, but there's oh. very new young um, um, uh, people, freelancers sometimes, mm. young managers who are going mm. to Sao Paulo from India, from mm. Bangalore, and looking at opportunities there. And, and and you know, at one point, you had all almost all ministers of the Lula government who had visit, you know, had visited Delhi. There's yeah. huge interest in the mm. south. Mm. This is something, and you can explore. You not know, to just talk beyond the Portuguese speaking world, but a south-south axis here, mm. and. Um, and it's being done with the IPSA in many ways. Mm. It's it's going on, but it needs really a lot of more thought. And I think South and India, going specific, can play a lot, a, a very important role. In that. That's right. And at a popular level, right? This is this is very um, the, the popular level. We just, I mean, an average Indian wouldn't know what's cooking between India and Brazil, right? Or what's cooking between India and Angola. So, or even with Portugal. So, I think that the the, the popular imagination sort of leads uh, relations sometimes. Uh, I mean, not always for the better, but mm -hmm. but it leads. And to the extent that popular uh, interest in uh, foreign countries creates uh, political uh, impetus uh, for change in policy, that's good. Like for example, Australia. Mm -hmm. Now, just because there's this business of students being beaten up in Australia, which was hyped, overhyped a lot, but suddenly it was making the news. So Australia became important, right? Mm -hmm. So the the, the, po the political leadership had to pay attention to foreign policy as as much as it affected Australia. There's no su no such thing, no similar thing. I mean, we don't want students to get beaten up in, in Portugal Brazil. or Brazil, but you know, there isn't a similar. You had uh, Abu Salam. Oh yeah, Abu Salam. <laughs> but that's but you know even that disappeared quickly because Portugal was uh, uh, was uh, did did uh, extradite uh, this guy. So I think the, the how to get this into a popular narrative is something which we should be thinking about. I think it starts at the elite level also, right? People are recognizing this. It's difficult to expect a big event between India, Mozambique, India and Angola. While the Indians lost awfully to the Chinese, right, yeah. in, the, in, in 2005. Mm -hmm. but, but, and that was a bit of a shock, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a Chinese, comp comp Chinese competition there, I think, that's waking up. I think the Indian establishment to see, hey, the Chinese are doing a lot of stuff, they're doing the Macau Forum, let's start doing something on similar. Right, let's do something in Goa.
Yeah. So anyway, that's that's a good conversation, uh, Constantino. It was great having you. Great. And from uh, Goa, we sign off.